Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 61, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. What's this in my hand? Oh my God. Now, I must apologise if I do get a little bit distracted during this week's show. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. You, you want me to do it, don't you? Go on, go on. <laughs> Satisfying sound. <laughs> I've got my hands on the Nintendo Switch. Oh, nice. And well, I got it on launch day. Well, I've just bought a Wii U, so I'm <laughs> a bit behind. <laughs> now, obviously, we're a retro gaming podcast. Um, I'm going to get, there is some good kind of stuff on the Switch that does appeal to retro gamers, I think. So Okay, so we'll cover it a bit in the news. And, and yeah. I'll tell you why I got it and what I think of it so far. And also, you've not got your hands on one yet, have you? No, no, I've not I've not even touched one yet, Dan, so. I might not let you touch it, actually. I might <laughs> just sat at the desk. <laughs> but yeah, we'll talk more about the Switch. Obviously, Nintendo, what a legendary company. Whenever a new console comes out, it's worth talking about, I think, from yeah, someone who's pretty legendary. much everywhere at the moment. Exactly. So we've got to cover it. Exactly. So that is coming up in just a bit. I'll give you my uh, initial thoughts on the Nintendo Switch. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it worth buying yet? What's it taste like? Yeah, that, we need to talk about that <laughs> yeah. as well. <laughs> People are like, what? <laughs> and also, on the Retro Hour every week, now uh, we work very hard to try and bring you veterans of the video game industry. And uh, this week, it's kind of a little bit different to you know, what we've kind of covered in the past. I mean, we're, we're kind of moving into like the late 90s with this week's guest. And obviously, you know, we've covered FPSs in the past, like we had John Romero on, we covered yep. Doom. This is kind of the next generation of FPSs after that. Counter-Strike. Yeah, and you know, we've got Min Lei, a goose man, Min Lei, who is basically the creator of Counter-Strike. Now, this was a mod that became a full game, which, you know, is unprecedented. And it's absolutely fantastically popular worldwide Counter-Strike. It's still, you know, Counter-Strike Source is one of the number one FPSs. And Min's got an interesting story. I mean, you know, like many of these, he started on like the Commodore 64 and the Amiga. And really it was kind of when, you know, he went to university in the mid-90s and it was um, Quake that really captured his attention, wasn't it? Yeah, that kind of early multiplayer online communities. But they were still doing it on like 56K modems. I don't know how (laughs) how they could have kept up or done headshots and stuff on that. Well, we'll find out in a bit. (laughs) So uh, Min Lei, the guy behind the legendary Counter-Strike, is going to be our very special guest on this week's Retro Hour. If you're a fan of FPSs and those kind of early days of it, make sure you hang around for this really interesting interview this week. And of course, the Retro Hour podcast would not be possible without the people who go out of their way every week to head to our website, theretrohour.com, click on that little PayPal link and find it in their hearts to donate a couple of quid into the cause. Yeah, and that enters them automatically to the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. What an accolade. Totally. (laughs) So making the Retro Hour Hall of Fame this week, we want to say a massive thank you from the bottom of our hearts to D. Lawless, Scott McDonald, Catherine Palacios, Peter Bovin, and Emma Ray, who all made very generous donations at the retrohour.com this week, which is a website you need to go to. If you ever want to put a couple of quid in the tip jar, everything you give us goes towards the running of the show, and we appreciate every penny that we get. Thank you so much for that, guys. Now, of course, with this show, we like to give back as well. Yeah, and we have got a fabulous giveaway. This is our first hardware giveaway. We're giving away a computer. We're, totally, yeah. <laughs> now, in the week, this is really cool, because um, this guy... Um, He lives in Nottingham, where we do. Yeah, Spencer. Yeah, a guy called Spencer. He dropped us a tweet a couple of weeks ago and said, look, guys, you know, I've got something for you. Do you want to come and meet us? (laughs) We were like, oh, okay. We'll come meet up with him. And uh, he turned up. We actually met him in a cinema in the afternoon the other week. Turned up with a little kind of inconspicuous looking little brown box. And he started pulling out all these little modules and uh, he had a little easel with a screen on it and kind of started plugging it all in. And it was this tiny little breadboard kind of... um, Z80 machine. You know, a little build-it-your-own kit. I did see that the room start to evacuate when he started getting wires and stuff out. (laughs) Yeah, people are like, what are these guys doing in the middle of the cafe? (laughs) But now, we were like blown away when we saw this. He's actually made, and he sells these kits, and actually it's his full-time job now, isn't it, doing this? Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, modular kits. So it's kind of like the Z80 has been built in... The only way I can say it is like a toaster... Uh, a toaster tray yeah and you know you've got your boards and you insert your different ones like bits of toast and you can kind of have different add-ons on it so he's he's making an sd card adapter for it and you know this is just for the z80 processor so he can display ascii out of it at the moment and any kind of text numeral stuff but you can also be compatible with other z80 machines so you know eventually you could get compatibility with the game boy or the jupiter ace or you know the spectrum like anyone that was in the z80 family yeah i mean he said you know it's essentially it's not really a clone of anything specific it is a modern 
Z80 based modular computer. And it runs Microsoft Basic, you know, since yep. you, you booted it up, it's got that in there at the moment. But it's kind of, you know, inherited the spirit of stuff like the ZX81, um, the Superboard 2, the S100, the Apple One as well. Yep. It's called the RC2014. Yeah, it was actually a competition he entered in at first, wasn't he? But then people started contacting him, like, you know, can we buy one of these kits? And the thing about it is, I mean, it kind of harks back to the earliest days of home computers. It is a build-it-yourself kit. And, you know, we're going to give one away this week on the show. Yep. So you need some, you know, minimal soldering skills. But I think, you know, this would be perfect for somebody with their kit. Yeah. Who is like, right, Z80, this is what we used to have. But instead of explaining it, you sit there and build it and learn how it's working. Yeah. That, I, mean, I mean, I remember building stuff like, you know, radios and Morse code stuff and, yeah. you know, in like technology class at school. But you're sitting down with your dad and actually building a computer together. Like you said, for a father and son project or father and daughter project, that'd be amazing, wouldn't but it? I, I would say soldering skills are essential for this one because me and Dan probably <laughs> couldn't construct it ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be a bit of a of an advanced electronics guy. Not yeah. massively, but you know. Yeah, you need to be able to know. A which, competent level. Which way around to hold a soldering iron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you'd like to win one of these, and the art, I mean, you know, everything is included in this kit. So if you'd like to win an RC2014 build-it-yourself computer kit, that is our competition on this week's show. Now, all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning, is head to our website, theretrohour.com. We'll also pop this link on our Facebook and Twitter as well. And uh, we've got a little question there that you need to answer. Now, um, obviously, the Z80 is a processor. So we want to know, what does the Z in Z80 stand for? A, Zelda. B, Zipper. C, Zilog. <laughs> so only one of those is correct. Yep. Which one do you think? A, B, or C? All you've got to do is head to our website, theretrohour.com. Leave us your details and your answer on there. We're going to give you two weeks to enter this competition. So it's open now, and it'll close on Friday the 24th of March at 23.59. Very precise. Yeah. Um, all the terms and conditions and everything can be found on there as well. And uh, what we'll do when the competition closes, we'll go through all the correct entries, pick one out at random. If it's you, you'll win one of these uh, build-it-yourself RC2014 Z80 kits. I'm so jealous. Yeah, it looks <laughs> it look, awesome. It, it looks does. seriously cool. I'm thinking about getting one myself. Yeah, well, he did say, didn't he? I mean, we might have to get one made of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we might have to get a pre-assembled one, but, you know. Now, uh, there is some other very exciting news out this week. Now, uh, friend of the show, David Pleasance. Oh, yes, the former managing director of Commodore UK. Yeah, I mean, David's a guy who spent 12 years at Commodore. One of our early guests as well on the show, probably about a year ago we had him on. Yeah, and he was there from kind of, you know, the very start to the very end. Yeah, well, the computer division, he was at the PET, he started selling, didn't yeah. he, the, computer, the Commodore PET, and then, yeah, you know, he was a guy that tried to buy out the Amiga after Commodore went bankrupt. So you think he's very uniquely placed to give, like, kind of the definitive history on what happened at Commodore totally. during their heyday, which is quite fortunate because he's decided to write a book. Oh, this is going to be good. All the stuff's going to come out in this. <laughs> it's like we've heard stories from David that we can't mention on the air and stuff, and we're sure a lot of them are going to be in the book, but there's some insane stuff, guys. Seriously, you would not believe how bad Commodore were. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I mean, you know, I've got to do a little disclaimer here. We are actually helping David with some aspects of the book. You know, we're, yep. we're going to be releasing um, like a Blu-ray interview that, you know, we're going to be doing with yeah, David. Yeah, we're helping set up the Kickstarter as well. So, you know, we, we do have a, you know, you, not really a personal interest financially at all in this, you know. We just want to see this book come out. Yeah, and we want to see all these stories come out so you guys are like oh wow that's actually what happened you yeah. know it's all these rumors and all of this stuff will be totally cleared up in this book well the thing is i mean there has been quite a few documentaries and you know other books about commodore you know the company on the edge brian bagnell book which is a really good read but this is really it's the first one that's been written by someone who is at the epicenter of the whole thing totally and it's not just David is going to be doing it. You know, there's going to be Dave Haney yep. as well, who was basically the engineer for Commodore. And at the end, he had all the plans for the future Amiga machines and they had actually, they'd implemented a lot of them. So, you know, he's going to tell us what could have happened and what could have been. And, you know, there are lots of people are going to be getting involved as well. Gail Wellington, I don't know if she's a name that you're familiar with. She was the head of um, CATS, Commodore Amiga Technical Support. Excellent. Um, very hands-on with the CDTV project that obviously cost Commodore a lot of money. And yeah. she's going to be making, you know, a contribution to the book as well. So it's not just going to be, you know, one-sided. It's going to be really, you know, like I said earlier, the definitive history of Commodore from the inside. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> and the Kickstarter has just launched today. Excellent. So um, I'm going to pop this in our show notes at theretrohour.com. We'll also share this in all of our so social network links as well. If you want to find out what really happened with Commodore and why the company went under, the stuff that really happened behind the scenes and, you know, 
I think this is a story. I mean, we always get the inside stories of Apple, Microsoft. This is a story that needs to be told. Well, what do they always say? The winners tell the story and yeah. the losers don't. And we're flipping it around. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you know, Commodore, they're, they're a company that kind of the mainstream kind of computer magazines and that, a lot of just kind of forget them. Yeah, you know, yeah it's, it's like... just been erased from history. So hopefully Dave can, you know totally establish it and get all the facts out there well you know we've interviewed david and we've known him for like years now and he's like uh you know i think like you said the amount of stories i wish we could tell on this show that is like what what did they say when they interview when we did the interview with um bedrooms to billions because of amiga years they said david pleasance was the most open person that they had and Mm -hmm was one of the best interviewees. Yeah. So, you know. Well, he's even, you know, when I was chatting to him, you know, we were filming the little uh, trailer for his Kickstarter, he was saying to me, you know, there are going to be lots of people very red-faced after I do this, but he said, the whole thing's the truth, so, you know, he doesn't care, as long as it's real. Yeah, you know, so. excellent. But there's a great bit in this video where I actually brought in a lot of my old Commodore machines, Yeah. and he got his hands on, like, you know, a Commodore 64 and an A1200 and stuff, you know, for the first time in years, and there's a bit in the trailer, I mean... You, That's you amazing, that. actually. You know, the guy who help launch some of these products and actually seeing them again. And yeah. you, you can bring that to him. It's great. There was one Amiga he didn't want to put his hands on, though. So <laughs> you'll, you'll find that out if you watch a Kickstarter. Definitely. <laughs> so, absolutely back this, guys. You know, it should be out at the time of recording this. You know, we'll keep you up to date on that. You know, hopefully it's going to launch today. Uh, we'll stick that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, we did mention that I've got my hands on this uh, rather flashy bit of hardware this week. Yeah, nice little device there. The Nintendo Switch. Now, you remember we've been talking about it since it was the NX project last yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, and the reason we've been talking about this is because we have seen so many companies go down the pan, like Commodore we just talked about, who had lots of money yeah. and were still doing well, like pretty much in the position Nintendo are at the moment, and we think this is make or break for them. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, I think if it doesn't work out for them, they'll probably end up on the way of Sega, you know, yeah, as in software, just software only, yeah, yeah, which, you know, might be where they head to. I did want to get one of these, um, maybe not quite so soon. I went out and bought this. Here you go. Get your hands on it, Robbie. Oh, go oh on. this looks go nice. On. Have a feel. Oh, it's very solid. <laughs> it is. Well, what do you, it's a bit weightier than I expected, actually. It doesn't feel cheap, and the, um, yeah. the analog sticks are really nice. Like, the kind of, you know, you can just feel the micro switches. Yeah, it? yeah, that's yeah. always nice. Nice and clicky. See, I went into my, uh, it was the Sainsbury's I went into on Friday night. Went in to get a loaf of bread. Um, ended up coming out with a Nintendo <laughs> Switch. Forgot the bread, actually, which I was in the bad books with the missus for. But what may be slightly concerning is the fact that I went into Sainsbury's at 10 o'clock on Friday night and just had some in. They had, like, 10 in stock still. Well, because Nintendo usually do that thing of holding back stock and stuff, so... Do you think they just went all out for this one? Well, I, I did see them make a promise that there won't be the, the, the stock shortages that the Mini NES had. I think I've just turned it on. There you go. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to boot up now, is it? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, the UI in it is so simple. I mean, there's even, you know, there's no web browser on it yet. There's no YouTube apps, nothing like that. It's literally just games, which is probably a good angle to launch a system with. You know, just focus on one thing and do and it. And I well. guess I guess they can do firmware updates and stuff from far yeah. away. And it's like you know, I've got a couple of games on here. The one I couldn't, I didn't actually get Zelda, because bizarrely. The Switch is quite easy to find. Zelda's not. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what's going on there. But I, I've been playing um, Super Bomberman R. I mean, I love Bomberman. I like the Super Nintendo and that anyway, yeah, back yeah. in the day. Very faithful to it, actually. And there's also a game called uh, Fast Remix. It's kind of like a Wipeout clone. You know what? It, it reminds me of the Dreamcast. And I'm saying that in a sense of the innovation behind it. Because yeah. when the Dreamcast came out, they had, you know, that little unit you could pull out and take oh, off. Oh, the and, VMUs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They had all of these kind of little devices that were really nice and innovative yeah. but it didn't last that long yeah. and the switch it seems really nice and inv- innovative i just hope it it stays for a long period of time you know i mean it would be nice to get that you know the new uh, mario odyssey game which is mm. kind of like the you know the success to mario 64 really a new version of that um but it's not gonna be out till christmas so unfortunately which really i think they should have had that, had that out for launch really you yeah know? yeah you need a mario title don't you it's like yeah. it's like launching a sega one without sonic <clears throat> so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i mean overall impression so far Pretty good, but I mean, it's only been out like, you know, the time recording this like three days, and there is only about like six, seven games available for it at the moment. I must one, say, one of Dan, which is Othello. I must say, Dan, <laughs> I've gone up to a few of my techie friends and I've said, Oh, have you, have you played with the Switch yet? And they go, What's the Switch? Oh, no. It's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not a good sign, is <laughs> not it? Not a good sign. No. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, some people have asked me. I did like an unboxing video on Friday night when I got home, which I'll, I'll pop in our show notes as well if you want to watch it. Uh, a lot of the comments have been like, So, do you think it's going to save Nintendo then? Is it going to work? I, you know, it's too early to tell, I think. I think it probably won't be that successful, but then the second version or the third version will be really nice and have a mass uptake. 
Well, I mean, time will tell. But, but yeah, yeah, I could listen to this in a year and then be just like, oh my God. <laughs> well, really, what I got, was I talking about? <laughs> I, I got it because I'm going on holiday in a couple of months and I thought, you know, I want to play Mario Kart 8 on the plane. Nice. And on the balcony because Samantha nice. takes like an hour and a half to get ready. So I thought, you know, I can sit, have a drink and it's like, you know, play well, Mario Kart. Well, I was saying to my girlfriend, you know, with the, um, with the screens yeah. and Nintendo's being around with kids, I reckon the uh, Switch screen repair industry is going to be massive. <laughs> yeah, but it does feel like it could break. Apparently, there are some stories of people, you know, the dock you get with it. Yeah. Apparently, it's scratching the screen when you put it in. Okay. So you've got to be quite careful. But um, do you want to hear it one more time? Yeah. Kind of. Oh, I love that. I can just do all that. <laughs> We're just going to get removed off YouTube for having that sample now. <laughs> Yeah, Nintendo copyright strike. That's yeah. actually so. Uh, you know, I'll keep you up to date with any interesting new titles. But initial thoughts on the Switch, promising, but you know, time will tell. Mm. So if you've got one, you know, do let us know what you're thinking of it. Drop us a tweet at Retro Hour UK. Now we are going to have to get suited and booted in a couple of weeks' time. Oh God, not again! <laughs> What's this for? I know, like twice in a year. This is because the British Podcast Awards are coming up. Oh yes, and uh, we have actually entered. We have. So it's going to be a very exciting one. This is a brand new Podcast Awards. And this is, you know, we've, we've been in for awards and stuff in the past, but this, I think, is uh, the kind of saying this is the first kind of official podcast awards. You know, The Guardian are kind of behind this. They want the sponsors of it, and it's happening, you know. Uh, Swanky Awards do at the Platform Theatre in King's Cross in London. Um, it's proper Get Suited Up Affair, and there's going to be, you know, some people that are kind of big in the media and radio industry are actually behind this. Oh, so, nice. you know, we have gone in for the best new podcast. Oh, fingers crossed. So well, wish luck. So wish us luck. It's on at the end of next month, so we'll keep you posted. And either way, it'll be, you know, a good excuse for a good night out. Oh, yeah, a good booze up in London. Yeah, we'll bring in uh, Paul Kitchen and Joe. Joe's coming as well, so... Oh, nice, and we can get on some hooch, oh, yeah, old yeah, school yeah. style. Yeah. WKD. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to win, are we, for drinking no. that? Who are we? <laughs> those guys? Get them out. Yeah. A little disclaimer, we don't drink hooch. No. Anyway, I did have some hooch about a month ago. Oh, God. I was out in Newcastle. Alco Pops. With my brother, we're out, and we went to this, um, God, awful, we went to this like, 90s bar. My yeah. brother's walking past, and they're playing... Um, do you remember Sash Mysterious Times? Oh, we've got to go in there. Old I school. would have been in there. And he's like, let's pretend like we're teenagers again. And it was the vilest thing I've ever had in my life. And like two sips, I was like, yeah, no, let's go somewhere and get a pint, shall we? So, yeah, I won't be having huge. <laughs> now, before we get into this week's interview, Prince of Persia, that was a classic. Oh, it was a great game. I actually had some students that I worked with, they'd come over from Italy. Yeah. And, you know, we were just talking about computers and stuff, and they were like, oh, Prince of Persia, Prince of Persia. So I gave them an Amiga 600 to have at their house, and they played Prince of Persia on that. No, no way. Yeah, very, yeah. very generous. <laughs> yeah, well, they <laughs> lent it them for a year. And they never it back. <laughs> uh, I think they really got far, but because it was really slow and laggy yeah. on that version, they were kind of like stuck. You know, you have to play it all the way through, don't you? In one game. sitting, Prince of Persia. Yeah, I can't remember what it was like on the Amiga. Some of the later ones had like passwords stuff and that, I think. But um, I remember seeing it. I was probably only about, what, when did that game come out? Like, it was 1990, I think, wasn't it, the original? Mm. I remember going to stay with my cousin when I was young. And like my mum and her went out. And I stayed in with like her husband and he was downstairs watching TV. And, you know, loving computers. I went upstairs and had like, a, like an old PC. I think it was like an Amstrad or something. And it had a black and white screen. Yeah. I remember saying that to Roman, who was a husband. I said, like, you know, have you got any games on this? And he goes, oh, there's a couple, you know, the suits in the box. And, you know, I had to kind of remember how MS-DOS works. I had an Amiga at the time. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, load, what happens here? Eventually got Prince of Persia booted up in it. And that was the first time I played it. Wow. And it was like a pirated, like, you know, a proper five and a quarter inch floppy disk he got off somewhere, handwritten label. But even on, like, a monochrome, it was probably, like, CGA or something, or EGA. But it was like, I remember that was the first time I'd seen proper animated fluid movement in a video game. Well, well it was rotoscope, wasn't it? So it was they kind of drew over the actions of a of a person running. Yeah, it was a real life actor they yeah. drew over, yeah, traced. So I mean, you know, and also a very atmospheric game as well. You got kind of that, you know, that Arabia kind of nights kind of feel to yeah, it as well. Yeah. So um well the reason we're mentioning this is obviously it's a classic game, but now there is actually um a thing called SDL Pop, which is an open source port of Pin Prince of Persia that runs on our Windows and Linux, um oh, which cool. is basically a disassembly of the DOS version and uses SDL. No, nice. so I guess that might be compatible for other SDL systems. Or something. It's cool that they've kind of you know disassembled this and actually released it for free, and also there's quite a big like modern community around it as well. Mm. Um, so you know people are doing like custom levels and there's level editors and all that kind of thing involved with it as well. And it's, it's a free download if you want to play. But is it, this so. a full trilogy then as well? Yeah, well, I think that I'm not sure if they've done all of them yet. I know they've done this one only got released about well fifth of February, so it was only like well yesterday at the time of recording so this. So maybe they're going through. <laughs> well, the website yeah. it says the Prince of Persia original trilogy modern community it's on so um, you know it's awesome just get the game for free mess around with it you know they've even got the source code available on GitHub 
So yeah, you could uh, add a Mario sprite in there yeah. and just go mad. I'm sure there'll be all sorts of mad stuff gets done to it. So, yeah, totally. Uh, if you to give that a download, I'll ship that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Right, thank you for checking out episode number 61 of the Retro Hour podcast. Don't forget, if you want to win that little computer kit, the RC2014 Z80 uh, Build It Yourself computer kit, you've got two weeks to do it. Head to our website and answer this question. What does the Z in Z80 stand for? A, Zelda, B, Zipper, C, Zilog. Now you've got two weeks to enter. Head to theretrohour.com. We'll pick a winner in a fortnight. Good luck. Right then, time to talk Counter-Strike. Oh, God, yes. Knife kills, uh, 56k modems. Oh, you're, you're getting Steam. excited already. Oh, I love it, yeah. <laughs> Here is um, this week's special guest, the amazing Min Lei, and we'll catch you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is our pleasure to welcome this week's very special guest, the man behind the legendary Counter Strike. Welcome to the show, Min Lei. Thank you for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Um, my pleasure. Now, let's get all the way back to the beginning. I'm quite interested to find out a bit about your history. I mean, what, what's your kind of earliest memory of computers or gaming then? Where did it all start for you? I guess. The first time I was exposed to computers was, I think, when I was around seven or eight. My my father bought a Commodore sixty four, and um, yeah, so that's that's that was my first exposure to uh, just uh, computer games. And uh, ever since then, I've I've been getting uh, the latest hardware. Like uh, from from then, I, I got an Atari, and then I got an Amiga, and uh, eventually I I worked my way up to the PC with the first eighty eighty six. So I, I pretty much went through all of the iterations of like PCs, and uh, throughout all of that, I I really was exposed to pretty much every game that was ever released back then. And <laughs> and back then it was it wasn't that there weren't that many games, so I was I was able to like really play all of them. But but uh but as as you know these days, I mean it's impossible to play all the games. But <clears throat> do you have any um favorite games from the Commodore sixty four or the Amiga that kind of stick in your mind? Then I remember playing this this one game. It was like I think it was called. It was kind of like uh, Karateka, uh, which was like a side-scrolling kind of like a martial arts game. But uh, it, was, it wasn't called Karateka. It was it was, it was something else. But uh, it was on the Commodore 64, and you would just kind of like uh, walk across the screen and just beat people up. <laughs> In international I think, karate, I, I, don't know, I think, I think it was it? called Kung Fu Legend or something. Perhaps. It, but but this one was, was, I think international karate was more like it, it, it didn't scroll. It was, I think it was just sort of. Uh, it took place on in one uh, uh, screen. Yeah. But this particular game I I, I liked a lot was it, it was kind of like a scrolling adventure game. You would scroll to the next one and and fight these progressively harder characters. But I mean, pretty much any Commodore sixty four game I I've pretty much played all of them. I, mean, I would say I played ninety percent of them. I remember this one game called Infiltrator, which had you flying a helicopter, and then you land and then you uh, kind of infiltrate into the enemy base. So okay, what was your first kind of programming experience then? Um, I started programming my first year of university. I was uh, learning to program uh, the original Quakes, uh, Quake C. Uh, so I think when Quake was released, I think it was 1996 or something, uh, they released the uh, the SDK for it, and the uh, programming language that they were using was kind of like a subset of, of C. It was called Quake C, and uh, that, was, that was really my first foray into programming. I was kind of self-taught. I, I think everything I learned was just from... Uh, the internet forums back then, which were just really kind of crude message boards. Yeah, it, it was difficult, but uh, but yeah, that was probably my first exposure to uh, programming. Well, Quake was obviously a landmark in first-person shooters. I mean, did you kind of uh, obviously play Doom and uh, Wolfenstein 3D before that? I mean, what was it? Was FPS kind of like a big deal for you at the time when you first saw them? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I played them all. I mean, I originally uh, it started out with Doom. I, I think that would be the first like FPS that really uh, started it off. And ever since then, it, it it kind of progressed to Duke Nukem and then uh, Quake and uh, yeah, pretty much like all of those early 3D games that that, that were really influential in in my my career but uh but yeah i do remember uh working on doom but uh I, I didn't do any programming on it unfortunately because um the only thing that it allowed you to do was create levels for it. so i think that was that was my, my first exposure to uh level creation. so these kind of platforms you know they allow you to mod stuff and um were, were you really interested in just modding for another platform or developing a completely new platform yourself Oh no, I was I was never really interested in developing a, a, a platform myself because I I realized the, the difficulty in, in in creating an engine, and I was never very technically 
inclined to to learn the the really low level uh, knowledge required to make an engine, like stuff like uh, writing the graphics API and working very closely with the with the video card and and also the networking. Uh, the low level stuff didn't really interest me. Um, I was more interested in more of the the intermediate uh, language, the game code that would allow me to uh, to, to uh, create games. So I, I was more interested in game design as opposed to uh, engine creation. So when you were at university, did you do much like LAN gaming and uh, you know, do you have parties and that kind of thing? Any friends that were into it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember playing a lot of Duke Nukem. Uh, back then, uh, Duke Nukem was was really popular, and um, and then in my second year of university, uh, it it kind of progressed to Quake. Actually, we didn't play LAN parties back then. I, I think uh, most of the times I was playing uh, over the internet, so right. I would just play over the <clears throat> the modem. Oftentimes, the connections would uh, kind of disconnect. But uh, yeah, I didn't really do much LAN partying per se. I I think it was because um. Uh, I, I just wasn't really close to a lot of my friends. Uh, like, I mean, physically close. But I mean, geographically, I kind of lived in an area that was kind of remote from from a lot of the people that I was I was playing with. So it wasn't easy to get together uh, for a land. So yeah, most of it was done. Over. To be fair, going to land parties back then, though, carrying a massive CRT monitor, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, I I never got a chance to do one of those. But um, when did you first play Half Life and kind of? decide that was a platform to start developing on? Well, much like everyone else uh, at the time, I think I, I got Half-Life as soon as it was released. It was kind of a, it was like a milestone for, for the uh, for the industry. And I, I think all of my close friends, they, I mean, we, we all just pretty much, we picked it up as soon as it was, it was available. So yeah, I mean, you got to realize back then there wasn't many games released, uh, you know, uh, at the time. So whenever there was a new game out, I mean, everybody just like quickly snatched it up. There was no hesitation because there wasn't really much else to play to be honest so so i mean as soon as we would uh we would uh, pick up a game we would just finish it and then we would gra- grab the next game and uh half-life at that time was, was was the big uh was the big hit for, for us and pretty much everyone i knew picked it up um, i never got much into the the multiplayer mode of it so uh i, I think it was because at the time i was kind of uh, bored of deathmatch like after having played quake for so long i was kind of like yeah, sick of the whole deathmatch uh, mm. gameplay. Uh, that, that's kind of when I decided to make Counter Strike. Actually, previous to Half Life, I actually worked on another mod called Action Quake Two, and uh, that that was the mod that actually uh, kind of inspired a lot of what I did on Counter Strike. Like it was like the mod that didn't have any respawns, and it had a much more uh, slower paced uh, feel to it than uh, than the original uh, Quake deathmatch. But Half Life had a really good story as well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. It had a great single player. That, but that's not the reason why I, I actually chose to to mod Half Life. Actually, <clears throat> I chose to mod Half Life because uh, the the graphics and a lot a lot of the uh, the physics and all that it, it took place in a kind of a realistic setting. So that kind of made it easier for me to modify it. So at the time, uh, there was uh, a, a few engines that were available to choose from. I think uh, uh, Unreal was one of them, and also uh, the Monolith engine as well. But yeah, Half-Life appealed to me because it, it's so closely related in terms of the theme uh, of Counter-Strike, in terms of just like the, 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 the look and feel of it and the physics and all that. So uh, I thought, well, it wouldn't require too much work for me to make Counter-Strike on Half-Life because I would just have to make you know, some new characters and some new weapons. And I could use a lot of the, <clears throat> I could use a lot of the level uh, graphics from Half-Life and make uh, levels for Counter-Strike. Well, um... It was very different with kind of PC titles back then because they favoured modders and having kind of community stuff. Um, Were were you ever kind of scared, though, that they might, you know, cut off the modders or kind of remove any of the functionality to enable people to mod? Actually, I wasn't really too concerned about that, to be honest. I mean, it all started with Quake and uh, ID Software. I mean, they were the first ones to really engage the community and, and really just... Uh, build a bridge between the uh, you know the developer and the community in terms of uh, creating uh, mods. So ever since then, I mean, like Valve have been perfect. I mean, they've been extremely supportive of the community. So I, I never really felt you know that that would go away. I always felt that those companies uh, such as Valve, Epic Games, I always knew that they would exist because of their close relationship with the, the mod community. Because I know there were some companies who like didn't like the modding scene at all, and like they even threatened to sue like people that did them of that, didn't they? Back then, 
Johnny, uh, you know, to be honest, nobody knew about this, but actually uh, the early version of Counter-Strike, uh, when we first uh, started working on it, uh, we were approached by Microsoft and they told us to uh, to change the name Counter-Strike because they actually had a game in development called Counter-Strike, oh, wow. but it wasn't released yet. Uh, so they were kind of threatening to, to sue us. Uh, but we kind of just said, uh, I, I mean, we just kind of stuck to our guns. And, and then we released Counter-Strike and eventually Counter-Strike became so popular that Microsoft kind of backed off and said, uh, we're not going to bother. And <laughs> I don't know why, but eventually they never finished their game called Counter-Strike. So uh, it was that was kind of a weird situation for us but yeah they, i remember being approached by microsoft telling us hey you got to change your name because we have a we have a game in development called counter strike so yeah maybe. Uh, but yeah it was weird they just after we released it and it became popular they just never talked to us again but yeah in terms of other mods that were being threatened uh, like the ones that use like you know star wars the ip and all that that was kind of a i mean that was always a, a threat even in the early days and that was something that i was always kind of in the back of my mind i knew i would never you know make a mod based on a, an established IP, because I, I never wanted to get involved with that, the legal shenanigans of that. But yeah, I, I, I always try to avoid that. You um, mentioned that you wanted a, a kind of a more realistic feel with the engine, and kind of frustration with the deathmatch stuff. Did this lead you to creating this, you know, world of terrorism <laughs> and counter-terrorism and very realistic guns? I played a lot of Rainbow Six at the time, so that was probably a, a big influence in my, my decision to uh, base Counter-Strike on terrorism. But in terms of the way uh, the the game design, in terms of like the round-based system, uh, that, that that's something that I kind of uh, stole from my previous mod, I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in terms of like the weapons, uh, the actually the, the way that I uh, came up with the buy, uh, the buy system, that was actually kind of interesting because I never really expected it to be so... Um, I guess so popular, like people kind of enjoy that, that, that economic of having to save up for a weapon. But I, I think the, the reason I came up with that was because I didn't want the guns to be so uh, unbalanced. Like I didn't want to uh, intentionally neuter certain guns so they would be more balanced with others. So I, I, I just came up with a system where, okay, you know, this gun is, is, is so much better. I'm just going to have to make it more difficult for players to uh, acquire. So, so that's why I came up with the whole money system. Yeah, when you consider other, other games like Modern Warfare, they they kind of like they they try to make all the weapons balanced. They give like penalties to certain guns. So you know, I, I wasn't really in favor of that though. I um particularly loved the knives, and I thought that was one of the first FPS that I saw with proper knives. I I, I guess I didn't really pay too much attention to the knives. The knives were just something that I kind of. I mean, I remember the first version of Counter Strike. We didn't even have knives, so whenever you ran out of bullets, it was kind of. Yeah. It was. Uh, it, I don't remember how they killed each other. I'll be honest. <laughs> Fist. Well, it, it got to a lot of uh, knife matches. I remember that when I was a kid. Just my knives only. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember that. It was always kind of like. I mean, even uh, when, uh, even at the beginning of a match, people would kind of like have a like have an honor system. Where, okay, this is only knives only, and then. And then the one person would pull out a gun and they would pull it out. <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah, every time. But, uh, when did you first realize how popular Counter Strike was getting? Then did you was it quite a, a fast thing then, or did it take time? When did you realize it, how big it was? It was kind of a gradual thing. I mean, I remember the first version we released uh, was fairly well received. I, I guess uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was enough for me to uh, motivate us to make another version, and then. I think it was around the third version where we started to see uh, really impressive like player numbers, and I think that's kind of when we felt okay, we we have something special here. I think we should just kind of continue to uh, develop it. And I think around beta four was when Valve uh, was when Valve approached us, and I, I, at that time I think we we had more players than uh, TFC. So I think that was kind of the moment where we felt okay, this is uh, this is definitely something special. Here. And were you quite heavily involved with the community around it then? And did you keep quite close to it? Uh, yeah, actually, we always, uh, even from the first beta, actually, we were very, uh, we had a very strong connection with the community. Uh, because actually, the community were the ones that were making all of the levels for us. Um, it was only like the actual like uh, development team was really just myself and my, my partner, Flippy. He was the one that was managing our website. And also, he would, uh, he would act as a liaison between the community. So... He was the one that was kind of directly talking to all of the, the level designers for Counter-Strike, and he was kind of giving them suggestions on how to improve the levels and, and, and stuff like that. So uh, the community were really a big reason of why Counter-Strike uh, took off so quickly. Uh, it's because we were able to leverage that uh, 
uh, a lot of the talented uh, level designers in the in the community to uh, to create the levels for us. And that's kind of why we were able to develop new versions so quickly. I imagine it's really good to have instant feedback from the community as well. But I mean, there must have been quite a lot of it. Was it kind of a bit overwhelming sometimes trying to choose, you know, which path to go down with all that feedback? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's always a big problem with with even even triple A developer. But uh, but yeah, I, I remember just having to just kind of filter through all of the feedback and kind of kind of gauge okay, which one should we pay attention to, and which one really uh, is something that doesn't really uh, apply to our game design. Uh, and that was always kind of like a, a difficult thing to do because I mean, a lot of the game design in Counter Strike it, it, it's it, it's um, it, it's kind of personal as well because uh, there was a lot of uh, suggestions for us to do certain things but <clears throat> we felt that it was it, it was uh, like i felt that it wasn't really uh, something that i wanted the game to kind of go down, down down towards um like for example i think i remember when i uh when we had the when we introduced the sniper rifle it was really really powerful and i, I remember we had uh like the players can run around with it and snipe without having any penalties when we introduced the change that kind of uh made it more difficult to uh, move and snipe. A lot of the community were kind of against that. And I remember the majority of uh, the players were, they wanted us to switch back to the old method. But I think we stuck to our guns and we kind of said, no, you know, this is ridiculous. We're, we're going to make it so you can't snipe while running. And so and I think uh, decisions like that, they weren't always popular with the community. But I think in the end, people kind of accepted it. And I think it was better for the, for the gameplay of Counter-Strike. But also, you had a massive focus on creating <coughs> developer tools for um, other people to develop for Counter Strike. Uh, you don't really see that happening much with mods. You know, mods supporting developers for the mod. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, actually, I, yeah. You know, the thing is, I don't remember making too much for the <laughs> that was design. I mean, because they were using a tool that was uh, released by uh, Valve. Like they were using something called Hammer, which is a level the level um, editor. And uh, I had to make a few changes to it so it would work for Counter Strike, but I don't remember it being too extensive. I mean, a lot of the level designers they would make some requests for me, from me, and uh, I do uh, I do remember making a few changes for them, but it was never too difficult. I, I think uh, I think we got along uh, pretty well with our community. So, well, uh, Dust of course is a very famous map for CS, mm -hmm. and I heard you weren't a fan of it at first. Yeah, I you know I think it was because it was too yellow and brown, and I was kind of sick of all these yellow levels. We were getting about a hundred levels a week, and I, I at one point I remember getting like ninety percent of them were like just desert levels, <laughs> and I was like, oh god, not you know not not another uh, yellow level. So I, I think that was the only reason why I was kind of turned off. But 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 I remember after we played played it uh, for a few days, um, yeah, I, I quickly grew warm to it because uh, it was instantly obvious how balanced this level was and yeah just how playable it was it was actually one of the the first levels that we felt it was perfect for for the bombing mode so and also the guy who made it he was such a nice guy that i really i had a hard time turning him down He's so <laughs> well it's it's really interesting because every version of counter-strike out there has a dust as their main most popular map you know so throughout the whole time period it's been put in everybody's psyche yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's been a de facto part of Counter Strike. I mean, it goes. I I would say it's probably like easily the most popular map, and, and for good reason too. I mean, it was it was it was just so well designed. Have you um, heard of the artist Aram Barfo, who is trying to recreate the Dust map uh, on a one to one scale? No, uh, in real life. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in Germany. Oh, I, Jesus. I'll send oh, you a God, link. Really? He's uh, he's really into it, and he's actually created. You know, a section of the map with giant dust <laughs> crates. He's made out of concrete and stuff. Oh my god! Yeah, that's I have not heard of that, but that, that's oh man, that's that's amazing. Yeah, that yeah, would, that would be surreal to walk around, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would be very, very like yeah, <laughs> just having like a real paintball match there would be really cool. <laughs> yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> well, one thing I wondered, obviously, in, in that time period, you know, the early two thousands, it was kind of you know, not everyone was on broadband then. A lot of people were still on dial-up internet. I mean. Was it kind of a challenge to get decent speed of play with all these different connections that people had? Some of them not very fast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a good point because I remember when I was playing Counter Strike, the pings would vary between you know ten milliseconds to you know up to four hundred, five hundred, and uh, it was just it was just something that we couldn't do uh, like on our end. Like there wasn't a lot that we could have done like to improve that situation. 
But I remember Valve, they, they did a lot of work in terms of making it balanced uh, for, for, the high, for the people with high ping. They introduced a lot of things like lag compensation. Those kind of things were really, really the backbone of what made uh, Counter-Strike so uh, playable for, for, for people of all different like, internet qualities. And uh, it, it, those are technologies that you see to, even to today. So I think it's it was a really really uh, it was a good 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 job on Valve's part to, to really improve those those technologies. I imagine back then it must have been quite you know a challenge dealing with the traffic and hosting for servers with you know that many players. We didn't do any hosting. Like as we just kind of provided the game and we provided the uh, the the server files and us. So basically, if someone wanted to host the server, they can just download the server and then just host it themselves. Nice. So everything was uh, community driven. So uh, there was no uh, financial burden on us to host anything. So that was that was great. That was perfect. Did you um Did you... ever enter the game yourself and just kick everybody's ass and then say it's me? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I I mean I played a ton. I played a ton back then. I was pretty good. Uh, I don't think I was ever like top one percent or top five percent even, but. I would say I would always end up in the top ten percent. I would say, but yeah, I remember playing maybe like four hours a day. So I I was really heavily into it. So uh, I never got into a clan, but um, I I just played it with my friends. Well, uh, one important factor about CS was the lobby, and I kind of remember that was one of the first games where I was sat there waiting for a game to start or players. It was a fantastic kind of interaction that you have in those lobbies, like a pre a pre match kind of. You know, getting uh, you warmed up and stuff. Yeah, getting you warmed <laughs> up. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't remember too much of that, to be honest, but I remember just, like, we didn't have an elegant solution for it, so we just sort of said, okay, we won't start until enough players are here. So, you know, I mean, uh, games these days, they'll, they'll have a nice screen and they'll have a nice chat system, so it's much more elegant. But, yeah, back then I wasn't very, uh, like, I wasn't a very good programmer, so I didn't really have a good solution, so. So yeah, it was it was very it was very crude. Um, well, this was also the first time I heard um, someone be able to broadcast audio on a mic. I don't know if that was after you were working with Valve, but um, that was a fascinating feature when you'd run around and someone would just shout something at you or play music to you. Smack talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. That that was uh, yeah that was completely Valve's uh, work. That was something that they added to the uh, Half Life engine so yeah I, I don't exactly remember when it came about but i do i do remember like a lot of the just how it changed the the community i mean you, you got a lot of like obvious kids just abusing it but i think it really helped in terms of like a game like counter-strike because i remember a lot of players would use it for communication so like to to uh, uh improve their their teamwork so i thought that w once they added that it was really really beneficial for like uh like team play esports that sort of thing you know? Well, taking a couple of steps back, I mean, do you, do you remember when Valve first got in touch with you then and when you first heard from them? Yeah, it was around Beta 3. I, I, I was actually working at another company uh, up in Vancouver. Uh, we were working on another game. The company was called Barking Dog, so um, it's kind of a smaller company that I don't think it really made anything big. But uh, I was working there, uh, and Valve approached me uh, while I was working there. They requested, to, uh, they requested the company that I was working with to make Beta 5. So... Uh, so they contracted them out to make Beta 5 for them. And after they completed Beta 5, I eventually uh, worked at Valve full-time, and uh, they hired me to do I, uh, I, I remember a specific memory of going into a shop and um, seeing Counter-Strike on the shelves and thinking, yeah. wow, this mod has actually turned into a complete game. And this, Yeah, you know, you, know, you know, the thing is, the funny thing is, when Valve first approached us, the game was free, and when they offered to buy the, 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 uh, the license for us, we had no idea that they were going to sell it. I mean, we had no idea that they could sell a game that was free. I was like, you know, there's no way. How can you want, like, who would want to pay money for something that can download for free? So it really kind of, uh, it surprised me when they, they turned around, they made a, a standalone version of it. And I was like, wow, people going to buy that? I was like, you know, I was skeptical. I, I didn't know because, I, you know, I was ignorant. I thought everybody in the world owned Half-Life. And I thought everybody in the world owned Half-Life. Why would they want to buy Counter-Strike? But it turns out that a lot of people didn't have half life, and and they just they bought the standard old counter strike. So that was a big, uh, it was a big surprise for me. So were you not expecting to make any money then when you went went into it? No, because I, I had no idea they can they can sell a game that was free. I was I was so naive. I was like, what? You know? So I was super shocked. I was like, but but uh, you know, I mean, I kind of you know, some people say, oh, you could have made so much, but 
I, I kind of, um, you know, I, I really uh, value the time that I had at Valve, and I, I, I kind of value just uh, being involved in them. And I think if it wasn't for Valve, Counter Strike would not be as big as it is even till today, because they really continue to support it, and they really they put a lot of work into it. So, um, so I, I think they deserve a lot of the success that Counter Strike's kind of not given them. So, well, what was the story with uh, Counter Strike Two then? Oh well, after I joined Valve, I was working on um, Counter Strike. Well, I was working on a prototype that I, I was hoping to turn into Counter Strike Two, but I was having so much problems working on it because uh, I was working on the engine called Source Engine, which wasn't done at the time. So I was working on an engine that wasn't complete, and it was difficult for me to implement new features because the engine would constantly change so uh i had that was one of the reasons why i had trouble making a a, a prototype and i think another reason i had making a prototype was i i didn't have a good idea of what i wanted the sequel to be i didn't have i didn't really have a strong foundation uh, or just a strong game design uh on what what i could improve on the original counter-strike i had a few ideas like vehicles and like i wanted to add dogs and these things but I, I wasn't able to implement them to into the prototype because I wasn't uh, the the engine the source engine wasn't complete at the time and it was giving me a lot of problems. So I think uh, that and uh, and just my my inexperience in game design kind of uh, led to the the project just being uh, just kind of canned and it never really took off. I was I was working on this prototype while Counter Strike Source was being worked on, and they asked me, oh, you know, do you, do you want to work on Counter Strike Source? And I was like, no, nah, I'd rather work on this because I want to work. I want to make a new game. Counter Strike Source was just, you know, Counter Strike reskin, so it, it didn't interest me. So, yeah, it's quite a lot to live up to, though, isn't it? Following up a game like Counter Strike, I imagine that was, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, um, you know, like, exactly. doing, like doing a second movie after a blockbuster. It's like, <laughs> you know, yeah, and I, I think that kind of affected me as well. I, I really, I wanted it to be great, but I just, I just, I didn't know where to take it from there. <laughs> I think I was just too inexperienced and. I just didn't have a strong like game design like background in order to really so yeah it never came to be so um so you ended up leaving Valve and worked on a new game Tactical Intervention yeah that was that was oh god that was a nightmare <laughs> um so yeah I, I left Valve in 2006 or seven we left on good terms though I mean I, I was I mean it was very it was very much mutual uh, like decision like they. They 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 felt that I wasn't really uh, enjoying my time there, and I, I wanted to do I wanted to work on a game that wasn't really restricted by the Counter Strike name, like the whole the whole phenomenon of Counter Strike. So I, I just left and uh, uh, I worked on this this other game on my own for a couple of years, and then I was approached by this uh, uh, a guy in Korea, and he said, uh, you're very famous in Counter Strike, or you're very famous in Korea. I can get you in touch with a lot of these big publishers and these big developers and so i moved there and initially we 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 were uh meeting with a lot of these big korean publishers and developers like nexon and uh cj and all these we met we pretty much met with every big uh korean publisher but the guy that i was working with he was very uh he was very controlling he didn't want to lose control of this project so he didn't want to work with them directly so so in the end we never were able to work with anybody that was competent and we ended up having to make this game TI on our own with like four people or something. Wow. Yeah, so it was a really small team and uh, we were just struggling to just make this game and initially it, w it wasn't going to be a free-to-play game so initially it was just going to be a straight up you know, put it on Steam, sell it for $15 and that's it. And then being in Korea they everybody says, no, no, you have to make this free-to-play there's no way, you know, there's no way it's going to do well if you don't do it free-to-play. So, so we had to uh, turn it into a free-to-play game and that involved uh, a great deal of uh, like changes to the engine because uh, in order to make it free to play, we had to develop our own lobby system and yeah. uh, and our own uh, database system. So that required a great deal of work, and we had to hire this guy. And um, you know, it, it took another two years just to, to to make it free to play. And then by then, I think the the industry kind of like I, I think at the time, like people were getting sick of like FPS or, or Counter Strike. In, I think at at the time there was kind of like a lull in like Counter Strike's uh, like popularity, and uh, I think that was at the time when we decided to release the game TI, and uh, yeah, it just flopped big time because uh, we we just weren't big enough to support like a free to play game, and we didn't have the infrastructure in terms 
like in place, like in terms of having enough servers. And, and also the game was very buggy. We didn't have enough, like we didn't test it at all. Uh, I remember testing it for like a week or two. And this wasn't our decision. Like this is not something as, as a developer we, we wanted to do. It was because our, our publisher was very, very strict with our testing. And they, they, didn't, they were really cheap. They didn't want to like, they, they didn't want to host a server and, and have uh, people play on it for free. So they wanted the, the, the testing period to last for like maybe two weeks. Mm. And that, yeah, that was, that was not enough time for us to iron out all the bugs. And uh, so we released this game that was really buggy and it was really just, it was really unpolished and it was unbalanced. It had a lot of problems with it because we were not able to test it in a large scale environment. Like the most we ever tested it was with like maybe a hundred people. You know, that, that's, ter- that, that's, that's terrible. I mean, because when I was developing Counter-Strike, I would, you know, I got the test Counter-Strike with, an, with like thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people and they all provided feedback. And they all kind of guided me in how I should change the game. So that helped Counter-Strike become polished so quickly. And but even then, that took two or three years. So when I was working on TI, we only had like uh, like two or three months to, to polish this game, to, to kind of like to, to fix the bugs and to uh, iron out all the gameplay kinks. And it was, not, it was not enough time. So in the end, we ended up releasing this game that was really buggy and unbalanced. And people saw it. It was very obvious. And uh, it was an embarrassment. Yeah, it was a big learning lesson for me. So uh, I left in 2013, I think mm-hmm. it was, yeah, 2014, to join uh, Face Punch, and I'm currently working on Rust now. So. That must have been really disappointing, though, yeah, when, when the game came out in a, in a state that you weren't happy with. Yeah, yeah, it was. You know, the thing is, it's kind of weird. People uh, people uh, said to me, I says, you know this game is shit, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm aware of that. Like, like I, I knew deep down inside this wasn't, I know this game had a lot of problems, and I didn't want to release it, but the thing is, the publisher was like, "We have to release this now," and you know, they said, "Okay, we have to release this." So, yeah. I mean, when I was doing the marketing for it, I was it was very difficult because I was very kind of like torn. I was like, "I can't believe I'm doing this marketing for this game that I'm not 100% behind. I know it's not. I know it's it's complete mess, and they want me to you know pretend that it's great." <laughs> so it was a very I was I was very conflicted doing that, and uh, even releasing it, I was very kind of. I mean, I, I think what I felt was I felt like I just want to get this over with. And if it's a hit, then wow, you know, that I'd be damn surprised. But if it's a failure, I just want to move on with my life. I think everybody on the team was just kind of like they wanted to just get it over with and, you know, just kind of move on. But, yeah, I remember just feeling a, a, a sense of uh, de- like, I guess just a sense of desperation and a sense of uh, like resignation. Just I just wanted it to be over. with. It was a difficult it was a difficult few years for me. I, I guess you don't play that game anymore then. <laughs> God no! Uh, you know, I mean, I, I used to play it when it first released. Uh, I, I there was a bit of it that I enjoyed. I mean, there's some things of it that I I thought I I, I did okay in it, but uh, there was a lot of it that I felt I wish I had more time to really polish it. But yeah, it was it was a big embarrassment to me, and uh, I don't mention it. <laughs> so, well, um, I try not to bring it up. <laughs> well, are you a fan of CS:GO as well? And is there anything on that game um, you'd like to change? You know. I mean, it looks nice, and uh, but the thing is, the the gameplay to me, it's just something that I've played to death. And you know, mm. uh, I played CS probably for like a good seven or eight years of my life. And to go back to CS:GO, it, it, it's it's so similar to what I used to play that I, I don't think I would because I mean, these days I play uh, other games like I play Battlefield One. I guess I used to play a lot of Call of Duty, uh, not not that not the future one, uh, the old one, Modern Warfare Two. Yeah, the, I the best, enjoyed the that best one. one. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't. I didn't like it when they started getting all crazy and you know Unreal Tournament style. But uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I enjoy. I enjoy the hell out of Battlefield One. And I don't know why. I just. I, I guess I just prefer uh, Battlefield One over CS:GO. Is because I think as I'm getting older, I, my reflexes aren't as good, so I'm able to really enjoy a game like Battlefield a bit more than CS:GO. Yeah, and I guess CS:GO is kind of changed a lot from the original with skins and stuff like arms dealing and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that, that kind of, you know, and it, I'll, I'll be honest, it kind of turns me off a bit because uh, well, the reason I uh, made Counter-Strike was because it had a very strong theme. It had a very consistent theme and it, it really kind of delved with, you know, the whole counter-terrorist and, and a lot of the units that we chose, they were realistic units like SAS and GIGN and, and it kind of like, you know, it, it, emph- it emphasized that and, uh, the, the whole skins thing, it's kind of, it makes it more like a circus. And I, I just don't really enjoy that. Because when I play a game, I want to be kind of drawn into, like when I play Battlefield 1, I really enjoy that. It, it looks like World War 1. So, so yeah, that's kind of why I'm not a big fan of the skins. 
And uh, you're currently working on the fabulous game Rust at the moment, um, which is <laughs> ultra realistic um, kind of survival <laughs> game. You know? Yeah, it's a different game. It's a totally different game. Um, I'll be honest, it's not, you know, it's not the first game that I would be playing. It's, it's a very difficult game because it requires a lot of time. I find I don't have enough time to, to really devote to playing it properly. So I, I, I tend not to play it too much. But yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I, it's, it's so popular with a lot of uh, the younger crowd who have that time. And I think it has a huge player base in that. So I, I'm really fortunate to be a part of uh, this successful product. And uh, I really enjoy working on it. Also, the, the team, the company that I work with, Face Bunch, they're, they're a great bunch. And they, uh, they, really, uh, they, they really give me a great environment to work So have you got anything else in the pipeline? Anything else that you want to work on next? You know, I, I, in the back of my head, I always, I always have a few ideas. I mean, I'd like to get back to FPS for sure, because uh, I, I can't really imagine myself. I don't really play any other games anyway. So, I, so if I were to make another game, I would like to do an FPS. I would like to do something more kind of like, you know, you, ever, you know, John Wick, kind of like, kind of like that, John Wick the movie. Yeah. So something like that. It was more, it kind of more like fantasy, but it's still grounded in reality. But it's, you know, it's a bit more. It's a bit more uh, stylistic than than Counter Strike per se, so I mean I I think something like that would be kind of fun to to make a game based on. Does virtual reality interest you at all? No, not not at all. I I think I'm just the the limitations and in, in the movement and all that. Well, just the movement basically. Mm -hmm. If they can figure that out, then I'd be interested in it. But until then, I, I'm not interested in it because I think for me the biggest part of games is movement. I, I think that's a, a big part of all games that I play. Like it's just the way that the player can move, and just the, the the feeling of movement, like the speed in which players can move. It's not like being able to do that in a game is is part of the appeal for me. So yeah, till everybody's got a virtual reality room in their house, it's a bit of a way up here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And a treadmill. Yeah. And I, you know, another <laughs> another thing is even if we did have the space to do all that, I think another problem with virtual reality is people just can't do what we can do in games, and I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy playing games is because. I can't run that fast, yeah. nor can I do that much movement in, in in a given amount of time. So, I think you know, if you made a game that where I had to do in real life, it wouldn't be a, as fun. I, I'd get tired, and you know, I don't think a lot of people can actually keep up with it. So, yeah, you'd trip you over would have the a bar. very restricted game. Excellent, man. Well, listen, we really appreciate you talking to us this week. That was really interesting. Oh, okay, thanks a lot, guys. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And if people want to keep up to date with what you're doing, have you got a website, Twitter, anywhere that they can follow you on? Uh, I do have Twitter. Uh, let me just check what it's called. I don't know what it's called. Uh, but it's called uh, at Gooseman CS. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Excellent, man. Well, lovely right. talking to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, guys. Have a good day.